Hello, I'm Pastor Steve Hay, and this is the online worship service for Asbury United Methodist Church on August 9th, 2020. Welcome. Good to have you here. About three years ago, we moved to Harrisonburg and decided to start looking for a new church home. And after a few weeks of visiting Asbury, we saw an ad in the bulletin for a new life group that was going to be starting and doing a Bob Goff video study. And Bob Goff is a character that we knew a little bit about. Uh, we'd read his book in the past and thought that he was a really entertaining guy and this would be a great study for us to get to know some people at Asbury and learn more about what's going on in the church here. Um, and as we worked through the series with our life group, um, it was ultimately one of the reasons why Caroline and I joined Asbury was because it helped um, deepen our relationships, not only with members of the Asbury family, but also our walk with Christ. Since the coronavirus hit, unfortunately, our group hasn't been able to meet in person anymore, but we have had the opportunity to Zoom a few times, which has been really nice to be able to keep up with the people that we miss seeing every week. We've joined the Sunday Night Life group that recently went through the Adam Hamilton series regarding marriage and relationships, which is an important aspect to review during this troubling time of coronavirus when we're all home with our families. We really enjoyed that study, even though it was with different people that uh, we hadn't met before, but I think that is what brought a lot of value to us, uh, getting to hear new perspectives and meeting more people that we hadn't met before and hopefully we'll get to soon when this is all over. Really what I think that we have both learned from having now been involved in a couple different life groups at Asbury is that as much as it's really important and valuable to just get to know new people, uh, it's also really valuable to get to hear their perspectives on the different uh, challenges we're facing, uh, all going through life together as Christians, in the world today where we face a lot of challenges, especially right now, it's really uh, been a blessing to us to get to hear those different perspectives and, you know, try to apply some of the things we've learned from others in our daily lives.
Listen to the word of God. So, Jesus said, for the sake of your tradition, you make void the word of God? You hypocrites! Isaiah prophesied rightly about you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. Then he, Jesus, called the crowd to himself and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, Do you know the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He said, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind, and if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. Then Jesus said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands, these do not defile. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. That passage is from Matthew 15, uh, teaching us uh, what Jesus had to say to three different audiences in one short time. But I was trying to think about, okay, what do we, uh, how can I connect uh, Jesus and his talking about uh, sewers and sewage and, and the grow moment with the, uh, uh, the folks, uh, Carolyn and Morgan on the farm and our time in the midst of this COVID. And I remembered a story um, it's, a, it's a way to not spread or not get COVID. And it is about cow manure. So not something I usually bring up in sermons. But today, uh, cow manure is the way to not get COVID. How's that work? Go to the farm, put your hands in the uh, cow pie, uh, and then you will not touch your eyes or your nose or your mouth. And when you go into town, nobody's going to get within six feet of you. So that's how I connect uh, the passage and the, uh, the walls story and COVID today. But seriously, I haven't tried that and I don't recommend trying that. But to say one thing, but not to do it, that's where Jesus' story starts here. Here, uh, the first audience that Jesus addresses is the Pharisees who came from Jerusalem to uh, Galilee and came the uh, four or five days hike uh, to see Jesus and to uh, sort of grade him, see if he was okay. And the Pharisees saw that the disciples did not wash their hands uh, before they ate. Now, it wasn't the, the hygiene that they were worried about. It was the ritual. And so they complained uh, about the ritual not being fulfilled. In our day, uh, we are not very ritualistic and we do not even uh, do much of anything uh, in our lives religiously, except, except we seem as a nation at this time in our history to take our politics as our religion. We, we think that if we get that right, everything will be solved. If we had the wrong people uh, knocked out of politics and the right people brought in, then that would solve things. And so in a way, we look to politics or news, the proper news channel telling us what's important. If we look at the news or the politics and get our input as to what's right that's that's the wrong place 
We would proclaim that uh, Jesus is the place to go to find out what is good, what is hope-filled, what is uh, right. But Jesus here talks about what's defiled, and we'll get to that again in a moment. But Jesus has harsh words for the power structure of his day. Jesus says there's something essentially wrong, and that essence is you are interested in what goes on on the outside, the appearance, what's important to our Heavenly Father is what's going on on the inside. And what, once that's cleaned up, then what we do out in the world will be better. So, first audience, Pharisees. And Jesus says, uh, your hearts are far from God. You are interested in the externals rather than the internals. The second audience is uh, Jesus calls the crowds to himself. Uh, the crowds are the people that are just trying to make it, uh, get through, put food on the table for their family, keep a roof over their head. Just the people that are struggling to, to move forward in, in life, and, and it's a real struggle. Now, days, it's a real struggle for all of us. So let's hear what Jesus has to say to them. He warns them after they've heard what the Pharisees have uh, been concerned with, the outward, uh, he warns the everyday crowd that it's not what goes in, what you have out in the world that you see and, and take in. That's not where your defilement comes from. Rather, it starts from within and then goes out. It's not food or, or uh, ritual or politics or the other that, that uh, uh, is a source of the problem. It's what's here that's the source of the problem. This is what's defiled. Now when we use the word defiled, uh, again, basically uh, the Pharisees were saying uh, the ritual, you're not doing the ritual. But Jesus was saying you're not uh, putting first things first. And we'll address what the first things are in a moment. But, but uh, there are two words that when I go back and think about what the Pharisees were arguing for and what the uh, crowd had overheard and what Jesus is trying to correct in their mind, there are two contemporary words that we use. But the word that Jesus used was hypocrite. Uh, hypocrite. They are the people who got the worst uh, flack from Jesus, the ones who, who pretended uh, to be right with God, who put on the image of being right with God, but did not have the heart matter, the inward workings lined up with God. Hypocrite. The word comes from Greek for a mask that the uh, uh, theatric folks, the uh, stage folks would wear. It had a little megaphone in it uh, that would uh, help uh, make the voice carry even further. And so you've seen in thespian uh, uh, images the two masks, the, the frown and the smile. Those are the masks that uh, uh, Jesus is referring to, the putting on of the appearance. And that comes from the Greek stage. But those people who put on the appearance are the people that are most um, in Jesus' target. Now, today we have two words that are very similar, uh, used on the streets uh, to, to hypocrites. Uh, uh, today we use the word poser. Uh, taking a pose to appear to be one thing that you're not. And the other uh, word that I've heard in the last couple years is uh, virtue signaling. I didn't know this uh, term and wanted to make sure I had it right. I looked at several sources. It was a, a blog from uh, Practical Ethics. Uh, has a blog uh, where it says, well, this is a way of, of uh, expressing your values. It's not a, a perversion of values, but rather it's a public expression of your values, and therefore it's, it's appropriate. But then uh, another uh, website, dictionary.com, uh, said, nah, uh, virtue, virtue signaling is, is trying to show to the in-group, the people that you want to impress, that you have the same values that they do, and to give a uh, kind of a, a sly uh, 
judgment on those who have different values than you are proclaiming. But it is about appearance. And then a third, uh, Urban Dictionary, something I go to when some of the younger folks say something and I don't know what they're saying, I go look it up on Urban Dictionary. And this is what uh, uh, Urban Dictionary had to say about virtue signaling. Tells it uh, the way I hear it most often used, quote, to take a conspicuous but essentially useless action ostensibly to support a good cause, but actually to show off how much more moral you are than everybody else. Hypocrite, self-righteous. Now they go on to give an illustration in uh, Urban Dictionary. Uh, Fred says, I see George has changed his profile picture to show his support for refugees. And Barbara answers, has he donated money or time? Is he giving English lessons? Is he making a room available for the refugees? And Fred responds, no, no, he's just virtue signaling. Hypocrites, your words are close to me, Jesus quotes Isaiah, but your hearts are far from God. So he, Jesus warns the, uh, the crowd, don't, don't, go there. Don't have a separation between your heart and your appearance. Uh, bring those two in line and have your heart close to God so that your life, your words, your deeds, your time, your influence, all of those will go in the direction of the kingdom. So that's uh, the word he has for, uh, for the, the crowd. And the third audience are the disciples. And Peter comes up to him and says, Jesus, don't you know you offended the Pharisees when you uh, said that about them? And Jesus says, well, he doesn't say it this way, but he says, don't really care. I want to tell the truth. I want to reveal what truly defiles. And that's the stuff of the heart not the stuff around us. Those things do come in to us, but they pass through. What's in there already is what needs to be addressed. And so Jesus invites those disciples to get it right. Now, we haven't seen a whole lot of hope in Jesus' words, have we? Uh, to the Pharisees, he says, uh, you're hypocrites. To the crowd, he says, don't be like that. To uh, the disciples, to Peter especially, as he often does, he says, you still don't understand? And so where's the hope? The church is in the hope building business. Where uh, is the hope in this passage? We see in this passage that Jesus is hard-nosed prophet, willing to tell the truth whether we like it or not. And so we see here where he says the stuff that you got to work on first in order to get the fruit out in the world is the heart. Because that's where stuff, the stuff that defiles the face of what God intended, it's wrong here first. Work on this, and then the outward is changed. And so we have in this uh, a way of, of understanding that uh, we are in trouble because all of us, all have fallen short of the glory of God. All of our hearts are, are broken or are, are defiled, are spoiled, are marred, are twisted, are, are in such a way that they cannot be used the way they were intended. And what was that intent? When God created you, when God created your neighbor, your family, created me, what is God's intent? That we would love and enjoy God forever. That we would love our neighbor. That we would love our life, our, our, ourselves, 
That's God's intent. And when, when, uh, that is, when our hearts are unable to do that, then we are defiled. And God, in Christ, confronts that. In this passage, there aren't words of hope to the Pharisees. There aren't really words of hope to the crowd. And, and even in the part that we read, there weren't words of hope to uh, Peter and the disciples. That comes later. The words of hope come when, after Jesus has been arrested, been tried, been beaten, tortured, killed on the cross, put in the tomb. And then, three days later, the resurrection, the Easter, the event that proves that his teachings are the truth. That he lives again, verifying that all that he's taught and that verifying all the scriptures have taught about his death and his coming uh, alive again. And so we have the evidence of, from an Easter event, but, but you can still miss it. Remember the walk to Emmaus event when uh, Cleopas and the other uh, disciple were on Easter evening after they had heard of the resurrection, after the women and disciples had, had told them, they were headed home seven miles outside of Jerusalem and, and uh, they were dejected, they were depressed, they were beaten down. And then a stranger, as we know, Jesus, comes and walks alongside and they, they invite him to join with their conversation and, and the, uh, the stranger, Jesus, asked, what are you talking about? He said, have you not heard? Are you the only person in Jerusalem that has not heard what has happened in this past week? That our, our leaders put to death Jesus, a mighty prophet, Jesus of Nazareth. We had hoped that he was the Messiah. And so here are disciples, even after the resurrection, who have even heard of the resurrection, who still say, we had hoped. It is that Jesus that was walking with them, even while they're dejected. That is our hope when we realize the price he paid for me, for you, for all of our defiled hearts, so that he could confront that ugliness within our hearts and, and help us clean it up, make it possible for us to become who we were created to be, to be able to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves, to start there and move it into the world. This Jesus was with them, but was not recognized until they came together around the table. And we look forward to the time we, Asbury and the wider community, can again come around the table and see Jesus as he gives himself again to us and for us. Our hope is not in appearing loving. Our hope is not in saying the right words. Our hope is not in getting the right uh, politicians into the right position or, or hearing more from the right news service. Our hope is in Jesus Christ and only in Jesus. He will meet us wherever we are when we invite him in and say, Lord, here's my heart. Here's the junk in my heart. I come to you and admit that I am not able to clean it up. I need you. Come, Lord Jesus, and take my defiled heart and remake it to the purpose that it originally had. To love God.
into all that we are and to love our neighbor as ourself. There is our hope. A post-resurrection Jesus who is alive now approaches you now who wants to take your defiled heart, my defiled heart, and reshape it so that it can be what it was intended to be. Remember these words that we often sing, I've slightly uh, varied it, but uh, uh, if you desire to grow in this hope, I encourage you to also join a small group like the Walls have. Uh, you can be in touch with uh, Betsy Peters here at the church. Uh, and her um, email address is on, online and, and she will help you plug into a small group where you can grow with others in having Christ clean your heart and change your life. But here's the words we sing that came to my mind. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. You dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock, we stand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, and often we feel that in these crazy days of COVID and you know, so many other tensions within our lives, when darkness veils his lovely face, we rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, our anchors hold within the veil, within our faith. His oath, his covenant, his blood, supports us in the whelming flood. When all around our souls give way, he then is all our hope and stay. On Christ, the solid rock we stand. All other ground is sinking sand. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Gracious God, we come to you because we know our hearts, and that's not good news. We know that in ourselves, we cannot pull ourselves into the light. We know that it is your power, what you have achieved these 2,000 years ago, what you are achieving right now in the hearts of many that are listening. That's what Jesus is about. There, in Jesus' hands, is our hope. So we place ourselves, 
I place myself in the hands of the great Savior, Jesus. Amen. Thank you.